All right. <laughs> so, uh, our next speaker is Sarah Slotsnick from Dartmouth College, looking at environmental magnetism in deep time. Uh, and so, again, we've got 30 minutes and then time for questions at the end. So, Sarah, if you want to take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you for that introduction. Everyone can hear me, right? Everything's good. Awesome. Um, so thanks for the introduction. And I wanted to first thank, you know, Max, Bruce, Dario, Josh, everyone at the IRM for having this virtual conference, even though it's virtual, and also for um, Andrew and Anna, um, because I really appreciate the opportunity to share this work that I've been working on, but others in the community have also really done and sort of share more about this sort of nascent field of deep time environmental magnetism. So what do I actually mean by deep time environmental magnetism? And we heard yesterday from Barbara and um, you know, she talked about how environmental magnetism is this bonanza, it's this thriving field and it has deep roots in soils and lusses and in sediments. And in the past 10 years though, there's been a few workers that have really started applying some of these environmental magnetic techniques to the sedimentary rock record, uh, notably several studies in Precambrian units. So we're actually talking really deep time. And I'll talk about the promise of this um, technique, this application going over you know, some background as well as a case study. And then I'll dive into the challenges of applying environmental magnetic tools to the sedimentary rock record and highlight unanswered questions that I have, and hopefully that can lead to some discussion at the end. And then I'll discuss some paths forward um, to move beyond those challenges, as well as you know, new directions that others have really been exploring. Okay, so we'll start with the promise. And in this community, we tend to utilize magnetic properties for iron minerals. Um, because we're trying to use these to you know, have the recording power and we're using it to make quantitative measurements and records. However, there's another important property which I'm certain you know, many people here are aware of and that's that iron and iron minerals in environmental magnetism, we use them for their redox state because iron exists in this wide range of valence states, iron two, which can be oxidized to iron three and back again. And this is a, there's a wide array of abiotic and biotic redox reactions that can actually make this happen. And this redox change can be recorded um, by changes in the actual mineralogy. Okay. So observing changes in iron, iron chemistry, iron mineralogy in the sedimentary record over time has really been a vital tool for understanding ancient earth environments. And this is a timeline of earth history. And you can see here that we have you know, ages moving to the right and today is over here. And the rise of oxygen 2.3 billion years ago was really first identified over 60 years ago based on simply changes in the iron mineralogy. What we saw were um, a disappearance of um, detrital grains that were rounded that were, had reduced iron them in them like pyrite. And then afterwards we had the appearance of red beds which had detrital hematite in them. And bulk rock magnetic techniques, I think are perfectly poised really to be incorporated into these studies because they can identify and quantify these redox sensitive minerals incredibly sensitively. Um, so at much lower abundances than traditional techniques like optical petrography, X-ray diffraction um, and certain types of spectroscopy, um, but especially geochemical extractions but they also are non-destructive. So we can couple them with some of those more traditional tools. And you might say, okay, that's great. We can use rock magnetism. We, we all want to use it, but what questions can we actually answer? And so um, although oxygen is really vital for life as we know it, the details of Earth's atmospheric oxygen levels over the past 4.5 billion years aren't fully constrained. And here I'm showing log oxygen um, and sort of they're in reference to present atmospheric levels, ages on the bottom once again in billions of years. And as noted in this plot, you can see that, you know, direct measurements of ancient oxygen are incredibly difficult and we need to rely on proxies instead. 
And we know that oxygen rose 2.3 billion years ago in this event called the Great Oxidation Event. Uh, but there's the potential that maybe it wasn't a singular event and there, were, there was cryptic environmental cycling before this event. And we also, you can see here, there's a lot of uncertainty into the levels uh, that oxygen rose afterwards during the Proterozoic. And these are just big open questions in, in the field of Precambrian Earth history. Here I'm adding details about the geologic evolution as well as the evolution of the biosphere to the timeline. Because as we talked about earlier, understanding this history of oxygen is really important because of life, because of biology. Oxygen is thought to be required for eukaryotes to evolve based on the necessity of oxygen in making certain biological compounds and animal metabolisms require even higher levels of oxygen. And this period in the Proterozoic where there's a great deal of ambiguity about oxygen levels is also when we see eukaryotes first appear in the fossil record as well as animals. And so understanding the surface redox conditions during this time period can provide an essential constraint on the timing and pacing of eukaryotic evolution and how it might've been aided, frustrated, or totally unaffected by changing environmental conditions. So in order to highlight the potential of deep time applications of environmental magnetism, as well as the types of techniques that are utilized, I'm gonna walk through this case study of the Nonsuch Formation. And it's right during this critical time period that, was, that I was talking about. So a little bit of background um, on what we think this time period was like in the mid-Proterozoic. Um, it's thought, as you can see here, that there were lower levels of atmospheric oxygen than today. So it's been suggested that shallow waters of the ocean would have been oxic, but deep waters may have been anoxic. And those anoxic deep waters could have had circulation like today and upwelling zones along the coast could bring them as well as sulfitic waters into shallow marine environments. And this would have been toxic to eukaryotes, could have been toxic to eukaryotes. And it has been suggested that it's a barrier for eukaryotic diversification. And as a result, some have suggested, let's look at terrestrial systems. Let's look at shallow lacustrian systems as an oxic haven for eukaryotic life and diversification during the mid-proterozoic. And the Nonsuch Formation um, is actually one of these environments. It's an incredibly well-preserved record of lacustrian deposition 180 million years ago. Uh, sorry, 1,080 million years ago. Got to get the extra zero in there. Um, and it's shown here on the map, you can see sort of close to the IRM, um, it's this thin purple line right here. It's outcropping for 250 kilometers in Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, the IRM is like eh, off, off the page right there. Um, and this is within the North American Mid-Continent Rift System. And it actually formed at the end above all of those volcanics. We have sort of this paleolic nonsuch, this rifted um, this rift lake. And we analyzed drill cores and outcrop sections from the locations that are shown in stars here. And I'll be focusing first on these red stars. Those are the three drill cores, but we applied the same techniques to outcrop sections. And I'll show a lot of data from this section right here at Potato River Falls later. So you look at this and this looks very typical of you know, a, modern, a modern environmental magnetic study. So we measured hysteresis loops and DC demagnetization um, curves on discrete samples that were collected along all three of these curves, cores. And then we also did subsamples of the stratigraphic sections of the outcrops. And here I'm just plotting coercivity, um, the remnants coercivity. And each of these data points is actually colored and it's based on the actual color of the rock. Um, and so you can see that in all three of these cores, it might be hard depending on your screen, um, but in all three of these cores, you can see that the coercivity goes, there's a transition, right? It has low values, it has high values. And of course, as we were just talking about um, with Dave's work, it's important to really dig in and look more carefully at these coercivity spectra to understand what that transition represents. And we can see that at the base, there's, it looks like there's just this sort of single peak, um, which you know, is, is overlapping magnetite and we're interpreting as it as that, whereas this transition has these two peaks. Um, 
and, and it's sort of this mixed phase assemblage. And then near the top, there's a single peak. Um, we actually did some updated fitting. You see here, there's a mismatch and there's actually a low broad peak here, which we've interpreted as pigmentary hematite as well. So hematite, pigmentary hematite, and then magnetite, hematite, and magnetite. And we can calculate the different proportions of hematite and magnetite within this mixed phase assemblage using Dan Maxbauer's Maxim Mix program. That's what we used here um, because of its um, ease, easy availability. <laughs> um, and if we combine this information with saturation magnetization and then the remnant saturation magnetization for each sample, we can quantify the abundance of magnetite and then of hematite in each sample. And I'm happy to answer details about that, um, but it's following off work um, that um, Yohan Lescu had done actually. And we did this and you can see here, we're now presenting our, our data in absolute weight percent. This is quantification. We have magnetite weight percent and hematite weight percent. And using this, we divided our stratigraphic sections and our cores into facies, magnetic facies. And these actually are, I'll be talking about them with reference to um, the water depth, the inferred water depth of the lake. And so you can see here, that's what these triangles are. They're just talking about water depth. That's what these triangles are. So in the deepest portions of the lake, um, we see magnetic facies one, and it has this low abundance of magnetite compared to higher in the section. And then when we get to intermediate water depths, we see sort of this mixed phase assemblage with abundant magnetite as well as um, hematite. And then when we get to this top area in facies three in the shallowest waters, we see that the iron oxides are all hematite. And as was mentioned, you know, this is just a model, this is just fitting. And so we wanted to really do additional analyses on select samples to try to verify um, our identifications and verify our hypotheses. So we performed um, fork analyses, ARM acquisition, and low temperature analyses, which I'm showing here. And so here you can see that we have these um, room temperature uh, warming and cooling curves. And then we also have um, this um, low temperature SIRM where we cool the sample in either a field or a zero um, field. And then we um, add a, a big pulse at low temperatures. And this is the warming curves. And you can see here, these really do confirm the presence of magnetite in our sample because we have these nice fairway transitions. And it really does show this huge change between sort of our facies two with the abundance and a huge loss in magnetite in our, in our um, facies one. And we're interpreting that this is due to uh, the trital input of magnetite that then is reductively dissolved in facies one. And this then is our facies three where our room temperature magnetization curve has this slight bend that we're interpreting at 260 as the Morin transition for hematite. And then it has this sort of continued loss in magnetization, which is typical for maghemite. And this suggests that, you know, the hematite could be forming through the oxidation of magnetite. And we do see a strong decrease in this fairway transition and the weaker magnetization, which helps support that hypothesis. And then um, sort of following up on what Miriam said, petrography is always important. And so we looked at our samples using um, electron microscopy and optical um, microscopy. We, TEM is really hard on, on rock samples. Um, but in facies one, we couldn't see any magnetite or iron oxides using these tools, only titanium oxides and silicates, but we did see a lot of pyrite present. Facies two had very little pyrite, but it did have these big detrital grains of iron oxides, including both magnetite and hematite. And then in facies three, we only saw ferric iron oxides. Um, we see hematite replacing magnetite. Um, and then we also see it see fine grain hematite in the matrix. And so combining all of this data, we interpret for redox conditions. And we discovered that there was an ancient, ancient oxyclime preserved in Paleo Lake Nunsuch. Facies two um, had intermediate water depths and you know, it has this detrital magnetite and hematite, which we're interpreting as the river load and lake input. And based on this mixed assemblage, we're interpreting that this was low oxic to suboxic waters. 
And then in phase C's one, reductive dissolution of all these detrital ion oxides occurred in anoxic waters. These could have been even just restricted to pore waters. This could be below the sediment water interface. And we know that they're sulfitic, at least at some point, because in the pore waters, because we see that early diagenetic pyrite. And then at the shallowest water depths, we see oxidation of um, detrital magnetite and other iron oxides into this hematite, which suggests fully oxygenated waters and pore waters. So one really important question um, is, you know, we were showing this and it's this stack. And so are we actually seeing changing redox that, it, that indicates a temporal change? We're seeing change over time or the way that we're interpreting that these are a vertical sequence of facies um, that represent what were once laterally distributed environments and that, you know, Walter's law. And if we interpret it that way, that says the lake was oxygenated for most of its duration. And so the way that we can address this is actually by looking at some of those outcrop sections I talked about earlier. And so this outcrop section in Potato River is actually at a paleotopographic high. So what this cartoon here sort of shows that only when the lake was at its largest and deepest would we have gotten deposition in this area. So when our, our sort of deeper drill cores are, so, are showing deep deposition, this area would be showing shallow deposition. And we ran um, exact correlation though is incredibly difficult. Um, and part of that is because we actually see a few different packages in and out of lacustrian deposition with fluvial sediments in the middle. Um, but rock magnetic data really show that these sediments are this low oxic facies too with um, right when they get near the rivers, um, sort of very shallow water, we do see a little bit of um, this facies three um, where it's entirely um, oxidized. And so this really suggests to us that we're observing oxygenated shallow waters at the same time as these sort of deeper anoxic facies are being shown um, in the deeper waters. And so this emphasized to us, or we interpret it that Paleo Lake Nonsuch was a well oxygenated um, environment for much of its water column and for its spatial and temporal duration and extent. And it could have been large, although of course, geologically, when we're talking in the Precambrian, um, very short lived um, oxic habitat for eukaryotes. There is in fact a record of eukaryotes from, this rock, from these rocks and the Nonsuch formation over 50 different um, species of really well-preserved microfossils have been found. And I'm just showing them here because fossils are pretty. And so you can see here, uh, Valeria lofastriata is this globally widespread um, eukaryote. There's this large spheromorph um, that we don't really understand its affinity. And you can see this eukaryotic algae here. Okay. So that's, that's sort of this deep time environmental magnetism case study, but there's a really exciting extension of this work and it's to combine it with paleomagnetism, right? So that we can provide the absolute timing of mineral formation. So if we take and measure the paleomagnetic direction and then compare it to the apparent polar wander path of the terrain and, con terrain and continent from distinct rocks, right? Not the ones, um, the sedimentary rocks that we're using, um, we could maybe get an idea of timing. And we're processing the data for the Nunsuch right now. This is hot off the rapid. Um, the samples are almost finished with their thermal demagnetization. We're doing two degree steps right now um, to pull off this hematite um, component. Um, we, I mean the Berkeley folks. Um, and so this example here is of facies two. And it's really interesting because you can see here based on the thermal demagnetization that there are three or four different sharp demagnetization points suggesting that we really have a lot of different minerals. And this actually gets to Dave's point, which was awesome. When I did the unmixing, I only saw three of these. Um, so we do have sort of some inference maybe from the unmixing of this coercivity diagram that there's sort of three different components and maybe another one. Um, but this looks to me, I sort of fit them as different directions, but they all plot on top of each other. So there's no real directional change. And this sort of confirms that maybe all these different minerals actually represent a detrital assemblage with the same magnetic direction that they were deposited at the same time, confirming what we thought. This is facies three with our pigmentary um, hematite 
interpreted here and our um, hematite at very high temperatures that we're interpreting as detrital and they're different directions. So this is really exciting, excited to sort of analyze all of this data to try to get at what's the timing of this pigmentary hematite formation. I'm not the first one to do this. Um, our group isn't. This technique has really been applied for decades by tectonicists and economic geologists. And here I'm showing an example by Alexandra Abrejevich and colleagues who analyzed this 2.5 billion year old princestone um, of the Mount McRae Shale in Australia. And they found that there were these two different pigmentary hematite directions shown here in blue and in um, red. And when they compared to the modern, the blue one, um, uh, sort of the number one component could be dated to 15, 25 million years ago. But the more unique uh, sort of newsprint pattern had a pole that it could be similar to one that was maybe 1.5, 1.6 billion years, um, or it could be from the Carboniferous. But it's really cool to think of this very low temperature diagenetic event that was occurring a billion years or more after deposition of these rocks. Equally interesting to me is that both of these directions have two polarities in them, as some of you may have noticed, and this really indicates prolonged growth of these pigmentary hematite grains spanning at least one um, polarity transition. And so this, this gets us to some of our challenges of deep time environmental magnetism. Um, diagenesis and weathering of magnetic minerals are processes that are still being investigated in the modern. And if we're trying to understand and interpret for ancient early redox, we need to understand timing and controls on all these processes. And I think there's open questions on the timing of diagenetic transformations. You know, when does early pigmentary hematite form? When do all these diagenetic magnetic iron sulfides form? Are the time scales short enough that it doesn't matter for the rock record, which is always something that gets brought up. And here is in fact some rates from the lab that have been done on experiments for various magnetic minerals. You know, maghemite isn't on here. And they suggest that in a few years, you know, all iron oxides would be totally lost from sediments and reducing our sulfitic environments. But this is not the case. Many of you, we measure these things. It's not the case. We've done empirical work. I think there's a really great study by Wang and folks at the IRM from 2019, where they study the suboxic Santa Barbara basin and really show this in great detail. Um, and this could be due to the grain size dependence of the experiments that were done in the lab, or it could be physical chemical limitations in nature. And work in the past 10 years um, has really emphasized the importance of this silicate protection around um, these magnetic inclusions and that these are sedimentary imports and they could maybe be preserved better in the rock record, um, whereas magnetofossils in similar conditions might be dissolving. So beyond these physical constraints though, um, what are the environmental constraints, right? I've been talking about redox and we need to know what those conditions are for these diagenetic transformations. And this is really important for developing um, these uh, measurements as an environmental proxy for deep time. And so here's a proxy sort of example um, for pyrite and pyrite weathering with the idea being um, that you can see, okay, we know this, this amount of oxygen and depending how long it was exposed to that oxygen and transported would say whether it was preserved or not. Um, but for magnetic minerals, what oxygen level indicate is, it, is indicated, you know, if we see maghemite in the record as a weathering product, what are the atmospheric levels needed for hematite or pore water pigmentary hematite formation? You know, I don't, I don't think we know these. And so we really need laboratory experiments and modern analog data directly measuring pore water chemistry along with the magnetic properties. And here is a really recent awesome example by Daniel Rodelli and Luigi Hovain. And they show progressive dissolution of magnetofossil bacteria, um, of magnetotactic bacteria. And they have pH, they have oxidation reduction potential, and they also have oxygen that they measured in the pore waters. It's not shown, but they see this reduction. And you can see it's on top of these thermodynamically stable regions does not match at all because biology is, um, is exciting. So we've been discussing diagenesis, but in fact, almost all of these rocks in the Precambrian have really seen metamorphism technically, depending on how you define it. Um, so while regions with the lowest grade of metamorphism are targeted, um, traditional 
tools of metamorphic um, petrology and this donation are still pretty high temperatures, right? So here I have in green, the biotite isograd. This is where biotite appears due to high pressures and high temperatures. The gradient is getting um, sort of more metamorphosed as we move over to the, to the um, west here. And biotite appears at about 350 um, degrees Celsius. So that's pretty high. Iron has clearly been mobilized. We see some interesting deposits in pyrite actually over here. Um, rock magnetic analyses of this region. This is the 1.5 billion year old belt supergroup um, in the United States and right next to Canada. Um, and it shows that, that there's a certain location where we have pyrotite and siderite that appears in these rocks. And I was able to map this um, and it appears and it appears to maybe be related to sort of this temperature and pressure, this metamorphism. And so while this is just, you know, one more overprint that needs to be untangled. Um, one more post depositional event. By mapping it, you can choose to target sort of um, more pristine samples. So, what are the paths forward um, to get beyond these challenges as we look toward the future? So, I've already highlighted important areas of research that I think are needed to really push this forward, but there's a few more I'd like to highlight. One is um, the use of in situ spatially resolved techniques like microscopy, right? And so this study uses squid magnetic microscopy to identify regions in 2.6 billion year old samples from South Africa that were affected by a 2.05 um, billion year old mineralization events. And you can see here that fluids preferentially were flowing through certain regions and turning those into pyrotite and the other regions were remained pyrite. And so then, the study um, carefully targeted these nodules in the center using um, sort of uh, SIMS isotope measurements, in situ sulfur isotope measurements, and that's what's shown here on the right. Um, this, the details here aren't very important, but it does show that there's this interesting evolution from the interior to the core to the out exterior um, of this nodule and this evolution. Um, from rim to core in um, sulfur 34, as well as the fact that um, cap 33 sulfur was constant, was interpreted to say, okay, these were deposited in an atmosphere and ocean that had very low oxygen levels, but there was still active sulfur cycling. There were sulfate reducing bacteria actually during this time period, which is, which is interesting to think about. Um, in the past five years, uh, magnetic microscopy techniques have continued to um, sort of evolve and develop. And notably, one of the newest is uh, quantum diamond microscopy, which I've been really excited about because it offers some really great spatial resolution that's comparable to, you know, the same types of tools that I use for optical petrography. And we have an entire talk tomorrow by Roger on this, uh, Roger Fu on this tool. So I'm not going to go into it, but here's some images also from Montana from that actually mineralized deposit where I'm searching for an unknown magnetic phase that we think has to do with this um, mineralization, but we haven't identified it yet. So as I showed in that case study of the Nunsuch formation, I think that absolute quantification of magnetic phases in weight percent or PPM is really important for furthering the field of deep time environmental magnetism for many reasons, um, but I'll mention a few, but you know, relative tools that we've used in the past um, in environmental magnetism are really useful with insight or even between sites when talking to the magnetics community. But if we want to combine our data with geochemical data, spectroscopic data or other information and then model an environment for proxy development, we really need to have this quantification and we need new methodologies for the wide array of magnetic minerals that we see in mixed phase assemblages. And there's adequate tools maybe for magnetite and hematite as I showed and um, Andrew Roberts reviewed and colleagues reviewed this last year, um, but continued development's important. It's not perfect um, as Dave was talking about. Uh, quantification though of gertite, which is ubiquitous in the sedimentary rock record is really, I don't know, it's, it's, it's time consuming, it's difficult. Um, some of the tools that have been used um, are work by Franz Legra and Johan Giotto in 2017. It's great. It's very time consuming. Here, I'm comparing 
um, some abundance approximations to the NPMS compared to chemical extractions. And just thinking about, you know, are there ways that we can try to approximate um, Gertite through these tools? Um, however, I've also gotten really excited or inspired by Mossbauer spectroscopy, um, which did a similar work with um, extractions um, and sort of comparing this and quantifying using Mossbauer. And I think that this could be a way forward, um, sort of combining that spectroscopic tool with some of our um, more traditional magnetic techniques. And of course, I just mentioned Gertite, but we really do need additional work on magnetic iron sulfides. We need Grigite, we need monoclinic and hexagonal pyrotype, um, and that'll be vi uh, vital. Okay, so I focused on redox conditions, however, application of um, you know, rock and environmental magnetism to sedimentary rocks can really move beyond that. There's been interesting work pushing in this direction. I can't highlight it all, um, but recently there was a publication on late Triassic rocks suggesting that pigmentary hematite could be used as a proxy for paleoclimate, specifically rainfall. This actually is from within our community, but there's no rock mag in the paper, but it's, it's interesting to look at. And then other work in the Precambrian, you know, has been searching for microbial activity. And this analysis is on 2.3 billion year old uh, iron formations. It's the Bulgida iron formation in Australia. And here they noted that there's sort of two Verway transitions, which they interpreted as two populations of magnetite. And they said this might be detrital and other observations suggest maybe this is microbial activity actually. Um, that was related to this formation of the iron formation. And then I wanted to mention that I've been really excited about um, Jan um, Lascou's work on analyzing putative magnetofossils of the 1.8 Gumflint formation, and he's having a poster on Friday that we can all look at. Okay, so here's a summary of what I've talked about with deep time environmental magnetism, the promise, the challenge, and sort of the future of applying these tools. And I want to acknowledge all of my co-authors, especially Nick Swanson Heisel and all the folks at Berkeley for the none such work and all these other folks who have helped in the stuff that I've thrown up today, um, laboratory support field um, work collection and the funding sources large and small that have made this possible and also show a picture of the new Dartmouth Mag Lab that was just constructed about two weeks ago. This just finished construction. And then um, I'll put up my summary slide again and open the floor for questions, discussion, comments, all, all of the above. Thanks, Sarah, very nice. Um, uh, I actually was asleep during Barbara Maher's talk the other night, unfortunately. It's just the time zones for this meeting have proven to be a bit tricky, but um, I, 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 like Barbara, think that uh, environmental magnetism, uh, th there's a bonanza of research questions that can be addressed and the deep time ones like the rise of oxygen are, are incredibly interesting and and magnetism can play a huge part in, in addressing all sorts of earth system questions so uh, thank you Sarah for, for pointing some of that out really really nice talk uh, so Miriam uh, great talk Sarah. very interesting so I have a couple of questions so my first question is about the hematite magnetite weight percent that you showed on section. And I'm not sure if I get the point on how you measure them. Is it from the and mixing and then you uh, you calculate or you've done some other measurements to uh, assess the uh, amount? Yeah, so all that I all that we did is the unmixing. And so technically the magnetite one, this is there's a 2010 study um, by no no. And um, he studied a lot of different ways to quantify magnetite. And I think you've done this, Miriam, in your work as well, that I just did the simple ratio for the saturation magnetization um, because hematite magnetization is just so much lower that it really doesn't influence it too much. It's in error. And for this unmixed one, what I actually did is, um, sorry, I'm trying to move around my, move around the screen with everyone's faces on it. Um, is I, I have here um, in, Ma in Dan Maxbauer's program, you can get the area under the curve for each of the components. And the, so we took that extended area as a proportion. And then I ratioed the remnant saturation magnetization, because this is a remnant measurement, to get the proportion that was hematite. And then used the range of 
hematite um, sort of values um, for MRS that were presented in um, a survey of work. Um, specifically, Ozdemir and Dunlap have a really good uh, survey there. And that's where, if you look here, I have error bars on my um, hematite, and that's what it's coming from. I also was incorporating the Monte Carlo error on the, um, the Monte Carlo area of those area estimations is included in that error bar. The magnetite, I don't have an error bar because it's just the MS value. Okay, yeah, thank you. So have you done some iron, uh, the sequential extraction on it? So yes, so this study, we did sequential extractions on it, on all our samples. <laughs> And, um, and this was a paired study. So this was actually published in 2018. You can see all the data and we've been adding more data to it, but not more extractions because the extractions were not quite working. Um, and so you can see here, the acetate extraction doesn't show any clear signals. The dithionite, which is supposed to pull out oxides, seems to work. Um, the oxalate, which is supposed to be for magnetite, is clearly pulling out something else. Um, and the pyrite really is focused where we saw pyrite petrographically on the one for that extraction. And I did some analyses actually here, and then I published another paper. Uh, I guess this is, sorry, 2020, that the oxalate extraction just doesn't work for magnetite. Um, so I know that folks have used it here in the soil community where you apply oxalate before you apply um, your dithionite extraction, but at least um, in this sequential extraction that's been used in Earth history on these shales, it's applied the other direction. Yeah. So, so that's also the, my, the, my following question about the, the plot where you show the um, uh, magnetization or temperature on the, on the Y and uh, um, iron dithionite on, on the X. So this mm -hmm. plot, so, um, so the discrepancy is is because also the diatonite uh this, this uh, yes it's yes yeah. it's because it doesn't work like uh, also the, the this step doesn't exact extract everything i think the dithionite extraction is a mixture it's extracting not just gertite it's supposed to also extract hematite um it also we were seeing it extracting maybe a wee bit of magnetite maybe some so it's extracting more than just gertite and that's why there is that variation is my guess, but this is just this is just looking at like bulk sample FC minus FCC at 10 uh, Kelvin. So it's not, it's just looking at the difference. And so we're not even capturing all of our gertite maybe, we're only capturing the stuff that's appearing um, due to the linear spread at low temperatures. Sorry, I, it's in the, I don't have that. I don't have that figure where I calculated it here, sorry. We've, we've got several other questions. Can we move to Thank you. Are you Thank happy, you very Mariam? much, Sarah. Yeah, no, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Mariam. Can we move to Roger? Hey, Sarah. Um, first of all, congrats on your mag lab. Uh, I like the, the green highlights. It's very, very nice. Um, yeah, I just had a couple of quick questions about your uh, the, the really high resolution VMAX sequence you showed, uh, showing the several inflection points in the, the hematite. Yeah, so I guess there's kind of two two quick questions. So one is, so I think you said you interpreted these these uh, you know higher slope um, parts as different populations of detrital grains. Um, so I guess the question is, um, what's the do you have other observations that that you're using to make that interpretation? And then I guess I think what you said was that the fact that these different um, populations, the tridal grains, the fact that they carry the same NRM direction, you're using that as an argument that this is a primary DRM. Is, is that is that right? And so this has that... not been published. So so this is okay. like this has not been published yet. This is feel free to uh, tell me that you do not agree with me. I actually we're not done demagging these. I, I made these plots two hours ago. So um so so here we, I did all of these samples, we have um, like this sample, we have coercivity data. And when I did the unmixing for that coercivity data, it looked like there were three populations, one low coercivity, um, like 36, one around, you know, high 90s, but we were interpreting that as magnetite based on seeing bare weight transitions. And then one that was this detrital hematite 
um, well, high hematite, like 500 narrow peak, not very broad. And those interpretations were backed up by our MPMS data, our low temperature data, as well as our petrographic observations. Um, so in this particular sample, I have not done the petrography yet on this outcrop. So we're sort of extending it based on those drill cores that we have that data for, but I do have MPMS data that shows the, the same bareway transition and all of those. So we, so this high temperature component, this is like 670 to 680 um, is where we're seeing this very high temperature um, component of hematite with that very fine. And the pigmentary is, can stretch much lower. There is a published paper on this based on a conglomerate test, Swanson Heisel 2020, I believe, or 2019. Um, and this goes up to 630, sort of mid 600s is where we're seeing our pigmentary, pigmentary hematite. Um, but in this one sample, we interpret, I guess I'm looking at this demagnetization curve and I'm seeing all like this looks like magnetite. And I have uh, on a nearby sample, I have MPMS data showing that I have a fair weight transition. And petrographically, in similar correlated samples, I can see magnetite in them. Um, but I think there's titanium magnetite. I've seen that in, in EDS. So some of these could be titanomagnetite. I don't know if this is gertite or not. There's not a lot of evidence for gertite in these samples, but I, I don't know. Um, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes and so, yes, yeah, so I guess I am saying if, like, if I was fitting this, I would just fit this with one component. Right? Like if I was fitting this as a paleomagnetist trying to do paleomagnetism, I'd say this is a single component. But looking at the demagnetization and based on sort of our other rock magnetic data, it looks like the, the sample is more complicated than a single, single directional component, multi mineralogical component. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That, that's really cool. Yeah, I guess the, the point I'm taking away is that if you have some independent indication, right, that these two different grain populations are both, in fact, a trial and the fact they share a direction. That's a pretty strong kind of field test almost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I have to be honest. We, it's going to be tough fitting these because we, we're trying to, like, this is the, 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 prior, the prior issues, right? Like, you don't want to impose your, you want to impose knowledge, but you don't want to impose too much knowledge. So it's going to be really difficult to fit our 150 samples that we have demagnetized. Um, so the, the, the pigmentary is pretty fascinating here too in that it's super ancient. Um, and it actually is like the direction that you'd expect as you continue, as North America continues to move. Um, so it's actually, it's sort of a fun problem here is the time scale of the aging of those pigmentary hematite precursors to be the hematite that's preserved in the, in the ancient rock. Because in this setting, it's not some later fluid flow event here or something. It's probably acquired, maybe it's thermally activated during the sort of extended burial history of these rocks or something like that. Yeah, I didn't um, mention, I meant to here, but these rocks have only seen 100 degrees and we're really far from mineralizing fluids, so. Yeah. But I would say I would say green's just a little present local field overprint on uh, the. Oh yeah, the green. Stuff. Sorry, the green is a. Present I would say that's field. that's not. Yeah, that's not a component. Oh no, no, it's but, not uh, a component. But the question is, is the green gertite carried by gertite or by MD magnetite? That's all I was saying. Was I? I don't know what it's carried by. But yeah, it's present local field. We've plotted that, and it matches really well. We we have a question in the in the chat from uh, from Kodama San from Pennsylvania. Um, I think Ken, why don't why don't you um speak up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. The great talks are really nice. Um, and, and you're pulling a lot of interesting things out of the data. But I was thinking about this. I tried doing a not deep time environmental magnetism, but like looking at Triassic type stuff around here with a, with a class years ago. And one of the challenges is convincing yourself, I'm reading my what I wrote, convincing yourself that the magnetic minerals really have survived from deposition. And they're really either deposition or early chemical formation. Um, because, you know, you're talking rocks a billion years old and they've, they've been through the mill probably. I mean, maybe they haven't seen a lot of metamorphism. So I thought it was really, this slide right here is perfect. So you do a paleomag and you put it on the parent polar 
wander path to kind of reassure yourself that the magnetic minerals are at least ancient and haven't been formed much later. But what kind of time resolution do you have? I mean, if, if you look at like red beds, I looked at, at the, uh, the database back when I wrote the book and the youngest red beds were 2 million years old in the database. So to me, that was kind of a, a limit of how long it takes pigmentary hematite to form after deposition. So you have some slop in timing, even if you look at the apparent polar wander path. And that's where, so the nuns at this time period, Laurentia is moving. So we're lucky, like I say Laurentia, but like the apparent polar wander path is moving if you look at some of the work that Nick's done. So we're at a lucky time period. So I think it, it actually depends at certain time periods, we'll have better time resolution than at other time periods, right? Depending on you know, what the apparent polar wander path looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is something that may be, may be more applicable in deep time because plus or minus 10 million years, 50 million years, I'm pretty excited about, you know? <laughs> and that's something that, you know, that's, that's I think for people who are doing modern uh, work, modern environmental magnetism, that's where your story is. And so that's sort of a difference. 10 million years, who cares now, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could also look at the magnetic fabrics to, to see if you have a depositional or compaction fabric, yeah. and which would reinforce the idea that you're looking at detrital type stuff or yeah. early stuff. And we haven't done that. And part of it is we're actually, we've been limited on samples. So these are outcrops, but even then the, the red bed is like this thick. Um, so we haven't... Uh, it's outcrop limited, but maybe we could try doing things like that to assess, um, you know, work. Thank Other you, studies so. of ancient rocks. No, it's Maxwell, good. Maxwell, you've been very lenient on timing. Are we are we needing to move on? There's a there's a text from uh, in the chat from Katie Garrett. Yeah, we can we can do that. Yes, and then we'll Katie, move. do you want to talk? Or I can read the question. Oh, no, I can go ahead and talk. Um, I've just, uh, I was wondering, and this might be a very simplistic you know, question with a simplistic answer, but if you have any concerns about oxidizing your pyrite within the pyritic zone contained within phases one and kind of in that pyrite transition zone within phases two, you know, as you go to higher temperatures and you're thermally demagging those samples. Yeah, so all of these, this, this is the outcrop and in the outcrop, we didn't have phases one. So these, are not those anoxic samples that have a lot of pyrite in them. All of these, if I go back, sorry, if I move my slide back, uh, these are from this outcrop section. So we didn't have that, that abundant pyrite. Um, so I'm not super worried because there's not a lot of pyrite in them. So, um, but I think that is a huge concern. Uh, I'm trying to demagnetize those samples from the belt. It'll be a project someday. Um, because they have that pyrotite in them. So I'm really curious about the timing of that, but it's going to be fun. Excellent. Thank okay, you so much. Thanks. I think it's time to move on. Thanks very much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Uh, back to Anna. Uh, 